And let's talk more about this, where the global economy is headed, according to the IMF. And we're joined by Yan Liang. She is the Chair Professor of Economics at Willamette University. Yan Liang, always a pleasure to see you. Thanks for taking time to chat with us. Thank you, Sean. Good to see you. Now, they always closely watch. The IMF is painting, as I mentioned, a sobering uh, global economic growth for the coming year, chiefly pointing at the anemic growth that has been out there and countries that are just saddled with significant debt. Tell us how we got here and your thoughts on what the IMF is saying. Right. So how we got here, I think, you know, the slower growth definitely will reduce the capacity to pay uh, debt. And so that, in a way, uh, in and of itself will contribute to debt, right? When you have less fiscal revenues, um, then you rely on more borrowing. And on top of that, we just know that, you know, the world has come out from the COVID pandemic. And so many countries, the governments have to borrow um, in order to just to maintain the basic public expenditure. Um, so all of this, I think, would create this environment mm. where uh, Gigiela talked about, we have slower growth, we have higher public debt, um, the public debt to GDP ratio on average uh, in, the, in the global economy is approaching to about 100 um, percent, that, that to, that to GDP ratio. Um, and we also had a high interest rate environment, which basically means that um, countries have to pay a lot on their interest payments. Right. And I think that is particularly worrying for some of the low income you know, countries where interest payment eats up about 15 percent of their government revenues. You know, and so I think all these are really challenges for the global economy. You know, and something else that should give many nations pause as well is the fact that the IMF is basically warning that robust international trade is not going to be the economic super engine that it has been, that punishing trade tariffs that are being adopted by the U.S., EU, Canada, and others are a big reason for concern moving forward. Absolutely. I think the IMF has been sounding the warning sign in terms of the geopolitical you know, and economic fragmentation in the world. Um, so two things that she mentioned, one is the expanding conflict in the Middle East and also the ongoing war in Ukraine uh, with Russia. Um, and on the other hand, she also mentioned, you know, as you just pointed out, that, you know, these trade policies, a lot of restrictions a lot of trade restrictions in the name of protection, uh, protectionism, you know, policies, and also so-called national security concerns. All of this would simply, you know, reduce the prospect of trade. And I think that really also, in a great extent, undermined the global South's growth um, potential. Um, you know, she mentioned that, you know, with a rule-based trading system, we can allow for lower price, better quality, and create more jobs around the global economy. Um, so I think that's very clear. And she mm. definitely calls for, you know, economic cooperation, right, to restore the kinds of trading, uh, you know, uh, fair and, you know, uh, efficiency-enhancing trade. So I think all these are really important uh, advice, right, for the global economy. Yeah. Okay, what's your take on the IMF uh, report that says global debt is going to approach 100% of world GDP by 2030? Uh, how should this guide what business owners do from a local and enterprise level? And also break it down for us, if you will, for people living in a developing nation as opposed to those in the developed world. Uh, how long can we rob Peter to pay Paul? Right. I think the key is really, as you just mentioned, the last part, which is, you know, we know in this world, a lot of developed countries, um, they're borrowing the so-called debt in their own domestic currencies, right? The United States, $35 trillion public debt, but that's in dollar. So, you know, they are not going to run out of money to pay for the debt. But developing countries, a lot of times they're borrowing in foreign currencies, which means they have to come up with the foreign exchanges, uh, which is difficult, right? When you don't have a lot of you know, access to the global market, you're not able to generate you know, export revenues. We now have 3.3 billion people live in countries where interest payment exceeds the expenditures on health care or education. Wow. So I think that is really the key um, that we need to address. And I think, you know, um, even though, um, you know, Gigieva talked about we need to, you know, reduce public spending and rebuild that fiscal buffer, but I think it's more important when we think about some of the reforms that she talked about, right? Made the global job market worse for the people. Um, we need to reform, you know, um, you know, immigration policies and also bring women to the job markets, improve skill sets. She also talked about, you know, mobilize capital, divert capital from speculative activities to more productive, you know, activities. And finally, she mentioned, you know, enhancing productivity by utilizing AI and other technologies. So I think all these are really important because by simply reducing, you know, fiscal spending, um, it's not really going to be conducive to economic growth because we need to invest in, you know, green transitions, 
you know, we need to invest in productivity enhancing kind of R&Ds and so on and so forth. Right. So I think that reform that she mentioned um, is really vital. Okay, and so the second largest economy in the world, China's done a lot in terms of its fisc fiscal stimulus measures recently, including plans to raise some $850 billion over three years to spur on growth. Your thoughts on that and, and how you think that's going to play in uh, to this growth that the IMF describes as tepid moving forward? Right. So definitely China plays a very important role. Um, according to the IMF's projection, China is going to account for about 21 percent of the global GDP growth in the next five years. And that compared to, you know, the G7 combined, which will contribute about 20 percent, which is lower than China's contribution alone. So I think this is very important. And as you mentioned, you know, in the past few weeks, China has implemented a slew of fiscal policy, monetary policy, and some of the reform policies. And I think that is very important uh, to help China to achieve that 5 percent, around 5 percent growth target. And I think some of these, you know, positive momentum, once it's kicked in, is going to help to continue to grow the economy and also help to, you know, facilitate some of the more challenging structural reforms yeah. going forward. You know, Yan Liang, not too long ago, we were talking about the possibility of a global uh, recession, but the IMF is giving central banks around the world pretty high marks for the most part for taming inflation. Now, what about the European central bank cuts uh, on its interest rates? And what does it say about where inflation stands in the eurozone and where it may be headed in the next quarter? Right. So I think the ECB's recent move, uh, that 25 bits cut, I think is the right move, right? The, the European economy is really, you know, in a very slow growth mode um, if it's not, you know, near recession in some of the major economies. And of course, you know, inflation has been a problem, but, you know, the foregone some of the cheap energy is another major reason for why the economy, especially manufacturing sector, has been slowing down. And it's clear, I think, from the recent Darcha report that the Europeans really need to enhance, uh, you know, invest uh, in the productivities and also, you know, to really upgrade their digital infrastructure and also really invest more in their, um, you know, research and education and so on and so forth. Um, so I think European economy is, you know, having really some structural headwinds. Mm. Uh, cutting rates is helpful, but it's not sufficient.